Welcome to lesson three. Uh, this particular lesson, we're going to talk about a bit more technical uh, aspect of information technology. We're going to touch on infrastructure and infrastructure considerations. We're going to talk a little bit about hardware, software, and then data management. So those are the primary areas we're going to discuss in this particular lesson. So from an infrastructure perspective, what exactly is infrastructure? Well, infrastructure essentially is what I consider the base of the tower. If you think about from an IT perspective, we really deal with three primary technology-based components. Okay, this doesn't relate to business processes or those. This is really from a, just a purely technical perspective. At the base of that tower is what we call infrastructure. Above that, sitting on top of infrastructure, is are what we call systems. We'll talk about what that is. And then atop the systems are applications. And I think uh, from that perspective, it's sort of like a pyramid, which each of those pieces relying on the piece beneath in order to function. Infrastructure really deals with sort of the connectivity pieces, the core pieces that are required or necessary in order to build an overall system environment. For instance, uh, infrastructure is often used to describe the networking technology or the network that's used at the foundation to provide connectivity among systems. In that case, if you think about the pyramid that I discussed, infrastructure itself has to exist or nothing else will really function appropriately. Uh, if you're in a standalone environment where you have one computer and one person, the, the, the entire model is somewhat irrelevant. But in many cases within the organization, nearly all cases, we're talking about an infrastructure that supports a variety of folks and a variety of systems. So the infrastructure piece, as I said, is that core piece that needs to exist before anything else can exist. The next lesson and subsequent lessons, we're going to talk about the other two layers, the systems layer, which really deals with servers, host systems, those systems that provide access to a variety of shared resources and then on top of that are applications, shared applications such as database, email, etc. So as I said we're going to focus on infrastructure for this particular lesson. So from an infrastructure perspective we have a variety of things to consider. When we talk about networking technologies we really have and, and again we're going to focus on this more in depth as we get into the classroom environment but if you think about networking technologies we really deal with a, a variety of different connectivity considerations. The first is a local connectivity consideration and that really relates to how do we interconnect within a geographically separated space, a geographically isolated space, those systems and those environments within that space. In this case you'll hear terms such as local area network, LAN. You'll hear terms such as 802.11 or wireless LAN, WLAN. You'll hear uh, terminology related to connectivity with Ethernet or, or fiber optics or some other specific kind of technology related to the local connectivity. Infrastructure considerations in the local environment are extremely important. Uh, the reason for that is that the connectivity typically in a local environment extends not only from the individual machine that a user might be using, but also back to the system components that allow access to those applications that provide business services, such as email or database access, etc. We're going to talk more in depth about what, is con what the consideration is related to local area network or LAN connectivity, as well as some of the considerations related to wireless as we get into class. But it is important to understand that that is the first piece of this environment. The second piece is the wide area network, or the connectivity outside of your local connectivity. And oftentimes a wide area network, a WAN, is defined as connecting multiple LANs. That may or may not be the case in terms of modern technology, um, but it is, a, it is a common definition that makes sense moving forward. So what is a WAN? Well, a WAN typically will utilize external services such as point-to-point uh, -point, uh, T1s, T3s, OCs, uh, optical carriers, which we'll talk about more in depth, uh, that are typically leased or purchased from a carrier. Now this can change depending on the environment that you're in. In some cases a carrier, carrier will provide what they call a dark fiber connection, for example. 
which is a dedicated service that's leased to the organization that only that organization has access to. But for the most part, and in, in, in many other cases, it is a shared leased service. For instance, the use of something like Frame Relay or MPLS. These types of environments are shared by multiple entities, managed and owned by the carrier, and then the services are leased to the client. So from a, from a business perspective, it's important to understand that there are multiple options as it relates to this kind of technology and this kind of connectivity. And really the choice of connectivity depends to a large extent on what is the best alternative for the organization, both from a cost perspective as well as performance and security. So cost, of course, uh, the organization will often want, because in many cases, connectivity or infrastructure has become a commodity kind of a substance. That is, there are many, many carriers, many, many uh, organizations out there that will provide the service. So from a commodity perspective, you, know, you can buy from a variety of sources. From a, a, a performance perspective, it's extraordinarily important because you don't want to put in a service or a connection between two points that doesn't meet the needs of the organization. For example, if you are operating, I'll use a more of, a, more of a, a home example, if you're operating an electronic medical record application where you have providers, physicians, etc., using an electronic medical record and the database where that information is stored is across a wide area network, if you do not have a sufficient amount of bandwidth or performance across that connection, then the system will be slow, it'll take longer to see a patient, Physicians and, and users will become upset and annoyed by the, the performance issues and you'll end up with problems as it relates to the success of that particular system. So again, the last piece of that where we had uh, cost, performance, the last is security. In certain settings, particularly here in the U.S., we, have, uh, we struggle with regulation and regulatory requirements around certain kinds of data. For example, if you're in the healthcare setting, you deal with HIPAA, the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act. If you're in the education environment, you deal with FERPA, the Federal Education Rights and Privacy Act. Again, different industries, telecommunications with the uh, Federal Communications Commission, the FCC, et cetera, different environments will have different regulatory requirements related to how their data is secured and protected. And so from a broader perspective, it's important when considering building out the infrastructure, those primary considerations associated not only with cost and performance, but also the security and protection based on the regulatory requirements in that market. And while there may not be regulation for certain kinds of things, it's obviously still important to consider how do I protect my data. So if I have a critical uh, system or critical component, data component that I need to move between multiple points, it may be a better choice to do a dedicated circuit, such as a point-to-point, -point, or some other purchase leased service that is dedicated to just my organization, than to use a shared service like an MPLS or even a virtual private network VPN across the internet. Again, these are concepts we're going to discuss more in depth within the course, but extraordinarily important to identify what are the needs of the organization before moving forward with the implementation uh, of an infrastructure. So again, as I said, from an infrastructure perspective, the connectivity pieces, the networking pieces are extraordinarily important. Also from an infrastructure perspective, the use of hardware is extraordinarily important. Now while I, I've described the pyramid with systems being at the next level, and typically you associate server hardware, et cetera, with systems, it's also a, a, a general infrastructure component. So considering that hardware, particularly computer hardware, is, a, is an essential component of any technology implementation, selecting the right hardware, making sure it's implemented appropriately, making sure that those users who are using this hardware have been appropriately trained on how to use the hardware, and ensuring that you have a support infrastructure in place to maintain that hardware is, are, are very critical steps. From a support perspective, and we're going to talk about training at a later time, but from a support perspective on the hardware side, selecting the appropriate hardware, one of the criteria is, do I have staff, do I have expertise in that particular hardware? For example, 
I'll use a, a, a sort of a traditional example. If I have staff, IT staff, who are capable of supporting uh, personal computers, PCs, particularly Microsoft-based PCs, uh, does it make sense for me to acquire and purchase an RS6000, an IBM RS6000 with AIX as the operating system? If I don't have staff that can support that equipment, does it make sense for me to develop a hardware standard that doesn't fit my support capabilities? So again, from a standardization perspective, selecting the appropriate hardware based on the needs of the organization and the capabilities of your staff is extraordinarily important. Software is very similar in that respect. Do I select a software platform that is unsupportable by my staff? And, and, and the answer, of course, is I hope not. <laughs> Otherwise, you're going to be either acquiring new staff, turning staff over, or figuring out an outsourcing option to support that software. Now, I'm not saying that's a poor choice or a poor solution. But the reality is, as issues arise, and an important consideration is that in any implementation, issues will always arise. Do I have the local expertise? Do I have the in-house talent to resolve those issues? Or do I have to rely on a third party, an outside entity, to help me get through those issues? If you have a really good relationship with an outside entity, then that may be your option. Uh, typically, though, most IT organizations are going to want to have some level of skill set in-house related to the use of the infrastructure, the hardware, and the software to be able to support that environment. Now, one of the fallacies that we often struggle with in IT related to those three components, infrastructure, hardware, and software, is that oftentimes our users will expect us to know an application inside and out. And in many cases, that's just simply not the case. For example, if I have a finance system or an accounting system, for example, that is extraordinarily complex, integrated, or implemented within the organization, as an IT person and as a support person, my team, my group, myself, may not understand the use of that system completely. Obviously with an IT, they're not accountants, they're IT, and so it, there's often a misrepresentation or a misunderstanding between the customer, who in this case would be accounting, and the IT staff in terms of who is responsible for understanding all the components of that environment. From that perspective, I think it's important to consider, and, and I always stress this as well within any environment that I'm in, systems belong to IT, data and use of the system belongs to the business entity. So in this case, IT has responsibility for managing the system, that is uh, disaster preparedness, business continuity, backups. <clears throat> data integrity, which we'll talk about shortly, ensuring that the system is secure, ensuring that users have appropriate access levels and roles. Those kinds of things are extraordinarily important from an IT perspective. But from a business perspective, actually taking ownership of the application from a use perspective, taking ownership of the uh, accuracy of the data, taking ownership of understanding how that system integrates from a operational perspective from a use perspective into the overall organization really belongs to the business. And so, so oftentimes I'll run into folks that will disagree with that, but the reality is there has to be a, a line drawn between in terms of responsibility, who's responsible for what. The last piece of this conversation, and while it may not be specific to infrastructure, it certainly is an infrastructure component, is the data piece of this. And while data is usually specific to a given environment, for instance, a manufacturing system, the data associated with a manufacturing system is typically specific to manufacturing, obvious reasons. It's also important to consider that managing that data and how that data is managed is also an IT consideration. So one of the distinctions I like to make, and I think it's an important distinction, is the difference between integrity and accuracy. Those are two very distinct concepts and two separate concepts that need to be outlined or defined. Data integrity is really the quality of the data from a usability perspective. What do I mean by that? Essentially, data integrity means the data is uncorrupted. It is, it is as performance-based from a performance basis, it's as efficient as it can be. That is, 
There's not a lot of redundancy or wasted space in a database, for instance. We'll talk about that. Uh, it also deals with security, making sure the data is secure. It's free of viruses, for instance, or any other kinds of uh, things that might impact the quality of the data. Accuracy, on the other hand, deals with the, the, the data itself. So while integrity deals really with consistency, accuracy deals more with, with the, the, the data uh, components themselves. For instance, if I have uh, a human resources system, from an integrity perspective, I need to make sure that that database is backed up, it's secure, that the, the, uh, the data quality, that it's not corrupted, et cetera. From an HR perspective, from a human resources perspective, if I type in somebody's name incorrectly, that's not something necessarily that IT is going to be able to catch. That is something that relates to data accuracy that is the responsibility of the organization or the department. So hopefully that distinction makes sense because when we talk about data integrity, we really are talking about a set of activities that are very specific to IT. When we talk about data accuracy, we're talking about a set of activities that are very specific to the business owner of that particular data. So that's an important distinction. The last real piece of this deals, deals with the use of databases. Now, while typically we, we place databases in terms of the pyramid at the top, a database management system, a DBMS, is an application that lives on top of a system that then rides a particular infrastructure. From a database application perspective, we're going to talk more in depth about this. The structure of the database environment is key in terms of how efficient and how effective from an integrity perspective that environment is. And so within the class environment, within your reading, there'll be a lot of material related to the, the structure of a database. Things like entities, uh, fields, records, tables, et cetera. Whether the database is a relational database or whether it's a flat database or object-oriented database. Some of the specific database structures or database types are extraordinarily important to understand and so we'll touch on that more in depth. Uh, it is important to understand that the last lesson we talked about the day-to-day, -day, the personal access to IT and IT systems and how they impact us. Uh, I would estimate that any individual person on, on a daily basis touches just dozens and dozens of databases regardless of what environment you're in you actually are a member of or touch multiple databases. Uh, for example, every time you use a credit card, every time you um, use your cell phone to pull up a contact, all of those are database access kinds of activities. When you go to your, your campus website, uh, your school website, when you go to any of those kinds of websites that have multitudes of data, you're hitting a database. So from a usability perspective, from a use perspective, databases are broadly and widely used. So that covers lesson three. Well, essentially, we discussed the concepts of infrastructure, hardware and software, and a little on data management. Uh, we talked about the difference between accuracy and integrity, and um, sort of an overall definition of the technical environment related to IT.